Okay, so it's always awkward to start these because my first inclination is just to run. So, um, but thank you guys for uh, making it through the first day of the symposium. And um, I'd like to, you know, extend my thanks to Crystal Bridges, everybody here. The whole experience has been fantastic and um, it's such an honor to be able to come back and, you know, share my work with you in a bigger sphere. So today, you know, I, you guys have all had a chance to walk around this exhibition and it, what strikes me, and I said this at the last time I came out, is that you can't help but have this profound impression of the state of American art. And what happens when you have that is you, you, you get a sense of the state of American culture, who we are, where we are, you know, where we're going, and why often it's such a struggle to really become who we really long to be. So the art, for me, really doesn't just you know, speak to that. It actually points to solutions and in a sense becomes a part of the solution itself. And you know, over the years when I first started making art for myself, it was really a trying to figure out, I was dealing with a loss of my family's land, but it, was, it then became the thing that what I was really advocating for wasn't necessarily farming or the land itself, but it was, I became, I basically started advocating for art. And so as we come here, and Chad talked about the three rubrics that he was using to frame this whole experience, and what I did with my work, and I hope to share with you tonight, is sort of how my work has almost gone through those rubrics and where it is now in the, you know, in the, pri in the privacy of a studio out into the public and then off into the civic spaces. And how, for me, the challenge is, is really how art can be an invitation to people and how it provides us a complex way of knowing our world. And we have never needed that more than we do now. And so, a lot of times I talk about how I have used it to find a sense of place or discover a sense of place and how important it is that to us as a, as a society, as a global community. And so when I say place, you know, that's one of those really, I said like dangerous words that I, I, I want to ground basically from my experience of being a farmer to give you some context. So this is my family's land outside of Phoenix, Arizona, and we've been farming ground out there since the late 1920s. And during that time, we've grown everything from oh, kohlrabi to bok choy to cotton to alfalfa. And my great-grandfather, I mean my great my great uncle started it, passed it on to my grandparents, who passed it on to my parents, and then they passed it on to me and my wife. And the thing about farming is, is that, like, like, like what I say, talk about art, is that it gives you a deep sense of basically connectedness, right? And because you're connected to the soil, the people you work with, and also, just even the weather, because it's become such a, something, all these things you can't control sometimes become the most powerful negotiations that we have. And one of the things I didn't really think about when I was farming these, let me get through some logistics actually. I, I never talk about what we actually grow, and I actually do farm, no BS. So I grow 230 acres of carrots and 40 acres of parsnips. We'd actually finished our last planting this week before I came out here. And luckily for me, it's 75 degrees in Phoenix right now. I don't want to rub it in, but, um, but part of my experience as a farmer really became about what happened when it would, when it would, when it would disappear. Because as I said, I'm the fourth generation farmer, but I'm also the last. And that's because of this. I know, it's such a bummer. <laughs> you know, suburbia has been knocking on our door for over a decade now, and I returned back from graduate school, and I had sort of actually shut, because I was an art historian, that's my love. You know, if I could do blue book surveys, you know, of slide comparisons, like, all day long. Do you do blue books anymore? I don't know, do they do? Oh, it's been so fun. But when I came back to the farm, I was shutting the door on that whole part of my life, and I was just gonna start, you know, basically coming into the family business. But when I came back, this was at our doorstep. 
And the only thing I thought to do at the time was really to try and figure out how to document this changing landscape. And I first did it with projects like this. This is a 20 acre field of barley that I hoed out a floor plan by hand w with a hoe because I'm totally crazy. <laughs> and I was also a lot younger. But it actually gave me some time to reflect. The whole process took about four months. And what I was thinking about the whole time was, well, I mean, your norm normal knee-jerk reactions when you see a picture of that suburban community, right? A lot of us say, oh, suburbia, that's so lame. But I, during this process, I started to think about the culpability of a farmer, or as, as an industrial farmer, being a part of you know, being colonizers, basically, and being a part of the process of laying the foundation for that type of development to, to come to pass. So I also filmed myself, and not just because I think I look good with those gloves and that hat. Come on. There was this futility in it. I really transformed the way that I was thinking about, you know, really honestly this incredible disappointment with the future of our family's business. And because of my art historical background, I was actually also thinking about we're being the stone, stone breakers. So this realist movement of this futility of these, this young boy and this old man, you know, crushing rock for this road. And how that's how it felt. Like, I am on this path to basically clear for development to take over the family land, and that's just how it was going to happen. Because that's what happened when the first seed that we went out and planted in the middle of the desert. And when I, my dad's a pilot, which is how I actually was able to get all these aerial photographs, and I grew up flying as a kid, and I, I had this sense of a thousand foot view all the time through my childhood. And when I got up here, First of all, I was really happy that all the lines were straight. <laughs> I did that with stakes and strings. It was before GPS was really in there. And when I looked out, all I saw was lots, housing lots. It was obvious to me, like, oh, yeah, don't point fingers, point thumbs. And so art, the, this process, this gave me a new way of looking at the reality of the situation. And it was just like, I couldn't get enough at that point. And I started going to all the city meetings for, we lived in, we got annexed into this city called the City of Surprise, which is a ridiculous name for a town, but. But I started hearing all the, what they were talking about. All these guys are in there and they're negotiating with the city and their lot plans. And what they're doing is they're, you know, I want five houses per acre. No, you can only have two. What they're negotiating is yield, right? Yield of the land. And that's something that I've maximized from our process of industrial agriculture. This is radishes. I know exactly how many plants per foot, per acre, that I can plant to make sure that you guys get that perfect spherical radish that isn't really even a radish anymore. And what's that sound? Sounds like suburban community. So, and this isn't just happening nationally, it's also happening internationally. So this vernacular is spread, this is China. And we all know like how, how fast that development was coming. And then really I was trying to understand from my perspective, like, well, you know, why does this make sense? And that's what this work was so good at doing is being a part of that artwork that asks us questions, right? gets ourselves to ask ourselves questions. This is the next piece I did, it's called More Estates, and I went and got, this is the first piece of land my grandfather sold. And so I went down to the city of Surprise and um, got the plot map from the developer, and I GPSed it out on a third scale right next to where they were building the homes. And so my dad and I planted all the homes, there are 250 homes planted in a sorghum, which is almost like a corn-like crop, so it's really tall. And then all the roads, my wife and I actually seeded in wheat. It was such a pain in the butt. This thing was like, 
It took a year and a half, and there was so many weeds. I mean, we, 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 had to, we had a pile of weeds in the middle of the, you know, that funny, the legacy area was the name of the community on the north side there, the top of the picture. So there was this massive pile of weeds. But anyways, it was, it just revealed this uh, power that art has to be able to do that. Because, you know, the truth is the issues that define our time aren't, aren't simple. And it's important for people to recognize that. And our situation on the farm isn't simple. Like I said, you know, we're complicit in some way for what was disrupting our way of life, or what is disrupting our way of life. And it was at this point I really, like, this work ended up on the walls of uh, environmentalists as well as a developer. And that was the power of that work. It kind of rode on that line of, you know, is it advocating for the environment or anti-suburbia, or is it actually, like, pro-development? And that's the complexity, right, that, that really good art can get us to ask these difficult questions that reveal the complexities that we face. And if we understand how difficult those use, you know, issues are, then I really feel that you can move forward with a more nuanced perspective. So I started to move forward and try and think, you know, I was making these big aerial land art photo, you know, photographs and stuff. And I just wanted to have a more direct connection about maybe where that disconnect was happening between people and the decisions that they were making. And so I started to make these basically engineered situations. This is called the Urban Transplanter. It was at a, a, a lot owned by the city of LA for 25 years. It was just vacant. And so we put this 100-foot 100, 100 long conveyor belt that would slowly spit out these transplants, and they would germinate over the course of two weeks, and they would slowly move all the way up to the front of the, of the city lot and then be shot out on this sled for the community to pick up. So you could come along and get a head of lettuce. And so this thing ran for 16 months, and we distributed 14,000 transplants. And none of them ever hit that. I put that little kind of stack of rocks, that bummer stack of rocks down there to make people feel bad if it started to pile up, you know, and just <laughs> die. <laughs> Although I don't know if these uh, transplants were just stolen and, you know, people were sticking weed in there instead. I'm not sure. Um, but it was this fantastic exchange. It was the invitation, that invitation that I was talking about. And it was incredibly successful. I mean, we basically, the, the community completed that work. And that was starting to transform how I thought about the possibilities of where this work can go. And the next place I thought, it's like, where, where are people making decisions on, on how they live their lives? How do they view their world? Where do we start to frame that? And I really started to see it in the supermarket. Or as I like to call it, that the theater of land use. And so I got this uh, grant with an organization called Creative Capital. And what I did is I started filming everything that we grew from seed to harvest to make these small films, short little time-lapse film, and it's the work that's in this show. And it's in two Walmart stores. And the first time we did it was uh, a few years back in, in Albertsons. And it was so simple, but it's some of the most powerful work that I've created for the state. And so I'd like to, it's a bit awkward, I'm, I'd like to share it with you. <laughs>
this is my family. Yeah, they're awesome. Uh, but every time I, I, I always, I can't help but, every time I see that video and I think about why I made it, it was because these two boys aren't going to have that connection to that land. And to have that, you know, that, that place to always come back to in a sense, that I was yearning for him. And granted, this is my, this is my hope, hope for them. But when I see that work up in a supermarket, and families are going by, and then all of a sudden, they just stop, and they're in awe of that squash plant growing, and they're breathing with it. That moment is hope for me, hope for my kids. And that's what's so wonderful about what art can do is that it wants to go where people are, right? And if we let it, and it surprises us in the mundane, that the effect is often wonderment, which is a really powerful source of, like, uh, you know, it's like instability, right? But it shuts us up, which I think we need more than ever. And you know it works because these kids, these two kids right here, when I put this up in Sundance and this Albertsons, they watched broccoli grow for 18 minutes. And I th that the last one, like, it was like, oh, broccoli again? It was like they were remembering, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I hate broccoli. I don't want to eat that. And the dad, I always say this joke, but the dad was so awesome is that the beer is already in the cart before he hit the produce section and he's he was just like making these laughs like oh god this thing's never going to stop <laughs> that's the <laughs> slack shot and it, it was it's such a simple project you know you just walk in and you see you think about, well, where's, where does sustainability resiliency come from? And at the end of these films, there's one little th in there. It says, you know, squash, 55 days to harvest. Carrot, 160 days to harvest. If you knew it took 160 days to grow a carrot, would that change the way about you think about the food that you're eating? And forget organic, conventional. We're, we're too far from that even to have a meaningful discussion, your food grows in the ground and in trees. And that's where the bar is. And this work, again, sort of lived on that edge of like, oh, is this marketing or is this, no, it's art. Art can do that. It can live on all those sides, ask us all those questions, provide a bunch of answers, and you bring yourself to it. But that moment of wonderment wipes away so much of the other stuff. All the things that you bring to it, your supposed belief systems can be wiped out in that moment. It's like walking into, you know, a chapel for the first time, hopefully. That's some of the stuff I try to achieve with the work. This is in Nuit Blanche in, in Toronto. And this is this 30-foot round crazy. And when, they, when plants grow at 10 feet, people are just like, whoa, you know. <laughs> and this thing's crazy. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. So it's, it starts at 7 o'clock at night. It goes to 7 o'clock in the morning. And a million people descend into downtown Toronto, and they shut it all down. And it's just all these art projects. But around, oh, around midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, you can actually smell the alcohol content, you know, of the crowd. But it was uh, unbelievable. You know, the p usually people had the intention spans of gnats during that night. And these folks, they sat for 26 minutes and just stared at plants growing in the middle of downtown Toronto. And at the end of them, they would like yell, like, I love you, squash! And like, <laughs> they're all cheering and guessing, you know, and everything, it was magic, you know? So going into those public spaces became really interesting to me. And so a couple years later, this is 
in actually downtown Phoenix. I worked with this artist from uh, London who does a festival called the um, the Feast on the, the the Feast on the Bridge, and we collaborated on the Feast on the Street, which this is a half mile long dinner table, and we invited the town of Phoenix to dinner, basically. And we worked with a bunch of community. We curated a bunch of community um, activists as well as nonprofits and artists and people just, we took over this urban space that, and of course in Phoenix is all cars, and people dressed up. We did salad tosses. There was, there was zombies, that guy's a zombie. And he went around to make sure people were composting. We had mobile gardening. And it was really just kind of this magical, whimsical event. And, but some of the best work, this is Mel Bergman. She's an artist in Phoenix, and everybody has a food story. Now, all the work that I'm talking about is trying to find that universal language, right? So food, feast, something that we all do around the world that we can relate to. And Mel would come in and ask people, what's your food story? And everybody had one. You can think of one right now. And she would illustrate it children, elderly, everybody at our age. And what happened, though, is that where can art be? Art can be on a napkin. It can be that moment, you know, that moment between two people, much like the social practice sort of, you know, relational aesthetic idea. But that was so powerful that people went home with these little pieces of work, and some of it was, this is fantastic. And to me, that was one of the most powerful things about it is that just this little drop into that pond and watching it ripple out. And we transformed this, again, this mundane, and honestly, this whole street is pretty lifeless most of the time, into this. 9,000 people showed up. We thought 3,000 people were going to show up. This is the port of entry in Nogales. I'm going to move into civic space now, which is a hard transition, actually, coming up. <laughs> this is where not a lot of people are congregating because it looks like that. Um, but uh, in 2012, I was invited by the GSA to do a piece in the port of entry in Nogales. And I mean, everybody here is familiar with the complex issues of, of, uh, of the border policy, especially in Arizona. We're famous for it. And I was meeting with the Department of Homeland Security and, you know, Border Patrol and they're asked, they, I only have like three, we only have three places that we can make work. And I found this one space outside this unfortunately named pedestrian port of entry and I made a shade structure. It's basically what it is. And it had utility, which is great. You know, it's that, you can never take that away from it. But what it was, was this local mountain range that traversed Mexico into Arizona from the south to the north, and it also separated the Tana Autumn Nation and the Arizona State Federal Land. And it's this historic path of basically migration. And I map migratory paths of people that have been walking that. And then I inverted it and created it into shade. And what was amazing about it is that it turned into this storm cloud. And again, when people walk through it, just for a moment, walk out into this and forget that they're in that place, surrounded by all the security. And not only for the people going through the port, but also the people who are working there. And it's just that, again, that little tinge of wonderment, just to kind of provide a window into you know, contemporary life. Now, I've shown you a lot of big projects, but I also, I just thought I'd throw this one in because I'm really fond of it. It's this fun little project I did. And, but it was really, it was based in a very serious issue because I was asked to go to San Jose to work in a food show. And I don't know what the expectation was, but I, you know, we grow, again, we grow, geez, okay. We go 20,000 50-pound bags a day we harvest from January 1st until July 15th. One of the things that I've never seen is I've been actually never seen one of my carrots in a supermarket before, which is totally crazy, which is actually kind of why I started some of that earlier work. But the other thing that we do is that we throw away the most awesome looking carrots, right? I mean, come on. 
don't panic, those are organic. That's what you know, when they look like that, they're, but what I did is I sat on the, the sorting line and for 20 minutes just grabbed every single carrot that was getting thrown out because it was too ugly, right? The aesthetics of it were bad. And then I basically had them scanned by this military helicopter company and I brought in this bag of carrots and I was like, here, can you scan these for me? And the guy's like, I'm like, yes, but I can't vouch for their authenticity. I'm like, dude, don't worry. I'm not, you're not gonna crash an airplane if you get these wrong. So, but it was 49 carrots that I basically 3D printed. And just the, you know, it's just, it's a lovely little piece. And it also talks about that waste and what, what does aesthetic mean? Yeah, I mean, you can laugh, they're funny, they're, they're awesome. And where I've been sort of, you know, not really playing around, it's sort of driving myself crazy in is in the, basically in the discourse of climate change, which is one of those uh, really unfortunate areas that I feel like art has a, an incredible role in being able to rescue that conversation because we're already, again, polarized before we even up, end up with this. So this project was the beginning of that. It's a collaboration that I did with uh, Braden King, a filmmaker out of New York. And we were invited um, by a museum, the Grand Central Art Center in, in LA, to basically celebrate the 100-year anniversary of the LA Aqueduct. And the LA Aqueduct runs for 226 miles from this Owens Valley, and it has this long, incredible political history, incredibly complex. I think they actually invited me because they thought there was farmers that were bombing the pipeline to basically, because a lot of the water was taken out of their, their work. And so what we did is we basically created our own pipeline. And originally, before they were making them out of steel, they were making them out of water. And so we took these scaffolding boards you know, using construction, but after a couple seasons, they have to decommission them because they fail. So, but they have this wonderful patina on them, you know, like of all the stucco and the paint and everything like that, and we just repurposed it and made this massive 50-foot-long, 8-foot-in-diameter pipe and then crossed our fingers that it wouldn't fall off that wall because it was about, <laughs> I think it was about two tons. What we did is we, we mapped it. For me as a farmer, there's, there's absolutely nothing more hopeful than a rain cloud, right? But it's also the most terrifying thing because it holds everything for you, you know, that possibility of rain and the terrifying thought that you might lose an entire crop to it. And this is what it looks like just this slow breathing object of the land where all the water's coming from and then basically the hope that where this pipeline originates will have water to actually bring to LA Valley. And this was before the drought worries. I mean, they are in a, they've been in a drought for a while, but it's interesting that this is basically really incredibly relevant at this point. It was up for four months, but it was, again, what it was touching into is this something again that people were coming into and every there was an engineer that just was like thank you my dad engineered this the see the uh, the oh my god I was gonna call it the Central Arizona project but that's our pipeline um, but anyways they he was an, they were an engineer on the on this pipeline and she found the beauty in it from there and then there was somebody else that said oh man we're so screwed you know we don't <laughs> we're, always, we're not gonna be here in ten years is probably more towards the truth, but so for me, when thinking about climate change, the most powerful tool we have right now is this, this idea of the observer effect, right, and that the astronauts saw when they first got out to space, and they hit this moment of complete, again, awe, and I feel like, you know, that, that, you know, there's moments that art can do that. I can't touch this, obviously, because we can't blast people off into space yet, especially with the latest setbacks. But I, I 
I'm, com- I'm just, I, com- I am convinced we're here to talk about environment and advocacy and artists, we, we need you there. We need to reframe this whole discussion and we can do it. I really do feel that. We can invite people to talk about this rather than tell them how to think. To, invite a, to, to provide a platform for discourse rather than one that says this is what you should think and this is our only option because there are an infinite amount of options. The whole thing is how we get to that end goal of still being around to watch this thing pan out. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm just going to stop because I want to have that discussion and sort of open it up for talking because I don't want to put you, it's really dark in here, you guys are getting really tired. I haven't drank anything yet, so I'm totally rearing to go, but, <laughs> but I just wanted to open it up, so please just ask me questions and tell me what you just, you want to go look at my family again, isn't that a great photo? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, does anybody have any questions about any of the work? I hope that I, oh, I'm done talking. You can clap now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look at, I don't want to look at Hurricane Sandy. Um, so yeah, what do you guys want to talk about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So, I, I'm cu- how many of you guys have picture of have taken a picture of a sunset or a sunrise on your on your phone? All right. Okay. So, continually, <laughs> all around the world, people are taking pictures of sunrises, sunsets, and clouds. And so, we have the technology to be able to harvest that right now, and basically create an immersive environment that shows, hey, everybody is looking at the same thing. And so for me, the talking about the science of it, it's like that thing, like we have to go back to the food grows in the ground until we, so we can get to the, the conventional organic if we're gonna use that as a sort of you know, tandem argument. So for me, to come up with that global language and understand that we're all people and how do we look through each other's shoes is such an important, that's what movement needs at this point because it's toxic. And immediately anyone says climate, they're like, oh, climate change, you know, climate, you know, there's climate. So we can all address that. It was 75 last week and it's, who cares what that means, but it's an experience and we all can recognize that. And I feel like once we start to do that, then again, we can come back to the discourse. At least that's my hope with the work. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Art, art history was, I mean, I really, I, I just stumbled into being an artist. I mean, art history was more, I was more, the rigor of it. I, and what I, what I loved about it is that you, you learn about form, you learn about, I mean, we're all, we're all, all that work, all the land art, I mean, I'm, I'm a product of an art historical canon. And I know, just subconsciously even, like, where the work's coming from, where it fits, why it makes sense, you know, for me to make, for you me to make those floor, floor plans right now wouldn't, wouldn't work anymore. And it's understanding, you know,
know, that canon that really makes you think really critically about what's your context, what you're saying, how it's communicated, how it's seen outside of your blinders then. And art history really helped me kind of suck myself out and be able to look on different sides of whatever the idea was and really kind of attack it. But I mean, a, a lot of it was more really honestly formalism. Formalism, you know, like just understanding materials and what it means to be in the round, all the concepts that we had to, to and to go and stare at that painting and understand why, why the people are positioned, you know, going back millennia, how, how they frame that experience. And for me, that was really important in terms of whatever success I've had, you know, I feel like. So I'm constantly kind of tipping my hat to art history. I, I, had, I go back. When I blow this, I'll, I'll go back and get my, you know, PhD. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, well, the being I've worked with a lot of institutions, you know, museums, and that was also helpful to, you know, create those networks. But the the organization Creative Capital that I worked with really transformed how I thought about art. It's it's an organization called Creative Capital. It's uh, it's they support artists. Um, they're doing great work. And if you guys haven't heard about them, look them up. But what that really did is. You know, actually before that field work, I was making sculpture. I was making big, minimal, concrete, I threw my back out sculpture, you know. And I did, for my graduate thesis, I had made all these rammed earth, big, heavy things, and I worked for eight months, and I was really into the, the, the almost that, the toil, like, oh, my, my hands are blistered, this is good work, rather than it being communicating and doing all those things I was talking about and from a hard historical standpoint. And I, the last two weeks before the, my, my show, I went back to the farm and I harvested all this barley and then put it in between slats and I hung it from like this entire space. So we'd walk in and there was just field of barley on the ceiling, the whole entire ceiling. And that was it. And it took me like that, you know. So that moment of I don't need all this stuff was a huge transition for me. And then the call from that organization really was about, well, again, how, how, where can art be? Art, this is an, a very welcoming space often for an artist, you know, a museum. But can art, can art be in a Walmart? Can it still be art? And for me, the challenge became how how do you invite people to understand that art is an important part of the human experience and that we need to support that and, and to invite people to that discussion. I'm working with a building in downtown Phoenix just trying to basically reframe their building by using artwork, redoing their lobby, but design and how they're doing their co-working space and putting art in there and integrating artists into a program so people can start seeing it and appreciating it and going, hey, I want to be a part of this. And so for me, that was also a big trajectory is making sure that in every single negotiation that I had, that I was thinking it from that creative lens. The department, yeah. Yeah, I 
I think so. I mean, a lot of, I mean, farming, uh, what I didn't really unpack in this is that it's really about, farming is a great tool of, of understanding place and understanding where you are and understanding the world. And, um, and farming in Phoenix in the, in the desert is problematic, you know, and from the start. So for me, the, what, what, what social practice as a body of work really introduced me in the feast is like this possibility of trying to, yeah. <laughs> um, but right now I'm actually working with a restaurateur who's a third generation restaurateur to start a restaurant that has an integral farming component in it. But from this idea of hospitality and the exchange of art, not as like the sort of normal, we're really looking at, I look at it as an ongoing platform of that, in, that type of engagement. So for me, it's trying to figure out how the two of those fit together. Because farming as a, farming is you, you to move and start up a whole new body of land. I mean, like this is the thing about agriculture and where we are now. This is gonna be <laughs> We can't even conceptualize as, you know, at, and especially in the West, the type, of, the type of life that farming needs from us, right? Because the soil wants 80 years of thought and engagement. And they tell a kid, like, oh, you want to be a farmer? Well, go buy a pot of land and then stay there for three generations is like, you how do you even communicate that, right? I mean, that's not even a part of our how we think about how we live our lives now. So to think about farming, we have to reintroduce it and, re and restructure it in a way to fit. We've blasted off over here, and now it's like trying to figure out how to make these two come back together. And unfortunately, much of the what you see, and there's a lot of good work happening in small, you know, in, you know, places like Brooklyn and urban areas. Um, but in terms of that long-term engagement of a producing farm, it's, it's, it's hard to fit in to what we've created. And we're going to have to figure it out. Um, but uh, for me, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, because people ask me, like, well, what's it look like? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. Because I know it doesn't look like what I'm doing now. That's not sustainable. And I know it doesn't look like farming on top of a, a, you know, a, a sky ride. And so there's that halfway point that we have to figure out where it is. And so I'm constantly keeping agriculture in my mind. But I'm also the farmer artist guy, which is also like, you know, Deborah Butterfield makes horses, you know. And, like, that's, that's my one-trick pony. So I'm, also, I'm always trying to keep myself uncomfortable, put myself into the arena that I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And I'm, everybody, I'm like, yeah, you do that, you know. So that's a part of, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, but there's a saying that once you get your dirt under your fingernails, you can't get it out. And, you know, that's, that's my identity. I mean, and, and if I'm not farming, I'm always farming in my head. You know, it's a part of my life. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful, right? I provided this image of what farming is like, and this is awesome. That's awesome. Everybody's like, that's awesome. You know what sucks is doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a better artist than I am a farmer. I just to say it. You know, like I am. And it's not because I don't want to do that. But, I mean, I recognize that what I can do is speak to farming. And I can always speak to farming because I've had a long experience. And I've watched the beginning, almost the generations are still here, the beginning and end of a farm, you know, where people are still around. I mean, that's. That's something that's worth letting happen and being able to see what happens from it. Me going out and finding 200 acres and starting a farm and being a farmer, like, that takes away from this work. And I'm convinced, well, I mean, talk to me in 10 years, but I'm convinced that um, it's the right decision. And, you know, the, f the restaurant, it has to evolve. And 
I, I have to evolve. That connection I want from my son, that, that we want for us, and we have to find another way to do it. Because this is not, this isn't just not staying here. It's not staying for our generation to come. It's not. So we have to figure out and not lament, but figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. And not in like the Luddite, let's do a Luddite. I mean, no, we have to make these two places meet. And so for me, I feel like I'm in that. I'm trying to figure out where they meet. And I'm trying to be a, a positive source of, Yes, we have difficulties, but I know that we're going to be here, you know, because, well, the, at least the earth is going to be here, because when we're talking about saving the earth, we're talking about saving us, right? And, but I want to be a positive voice in that, and I think that this work can do that. So that's a long answer to, don't tell me I can't. <laughs> yeah, but I understand that. No, in terms of why did I use a hoe? Yeah. Totally. 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 Yeah. Yeah, that myth and the romanticism of the farmer. And at the point, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. In reflection, I was playing in because people would be like, oh, you poor farmer. You know, you, you're losing your family's land. And it's like, well, my family's selling the land, right? And there's 30 kids, there's 30 people that are going to benefit from that, but I mean, like, we're, we're profiting from that. And so it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess to be on that side of, but I, for me at that point, I, it was true reflection. And I, actually, I just didn't know if I would, I, I had to hoe it because the strings, <laughs> I just didn't know where it was. And I, w I didn't want to whack, and if you take it down one, that's it. That whole line thing, I mean, if I mechanically mess up once, I have to wait until next year. It's ridiculous. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> it worked out. But I, I, you know, I did, let me just stop saying that. Um, the, heroic, the, the heroicism of, of that is, became a paradox for me. And point that I would start to talk about, yeah, you know, my family's profiting from this land. I'm not up here saying that poor farmer. I'm saying, what are we going to do? Yeah, it has to be different. Until the price, uh, until agricultural land, right now, I mean, it's just that's, that's, the, that's the accounting of it, right? I, no one is going to come up to you and your family and you think, my grandfather started farming to better the family. And so he gets this moment where he looks at all the cotton that he could grow and one check that says, here, here's, here's for 20 acres. And he looks at all that and he says, what's he going to do? So he's got his aunts, his nephews, all the grandkids. I mean, they're just, he can take care of that and succeed at what he started doing. And you can't hate, can't hate that, right? They're, that's what we would do. It sucks. But that's what we do, and that's what we face. I mean, because when we think about, and that's the same paradox of thinking about conventional farmers going to organic. It's risky. It's not an easy road. So all of those decisions, like, why don't you grow organic? Well, you have to take your land out of rotation for three years. And what's that land going to produce while it's not in that, in that rotation? And then you put up, you mortgage your land to be able to make that jump, and then what if you blow it? And then my grandpa, all the grandkids, they're hoes. So, I mean, like, those discussions, they're complex. And I know, you know, just I know what I'd, I'd love to grow organic. I just haven't figured out how to get the path there. And so, I mean, that's, for me, I'm a walking paradox, you know, in my sweet jeans and, you know, nice shoes, like, you know, wearing a John Deere hat. I mean, that's. But it, that's, that's the reality of what we face, is that we're all paradoxes. We're all just a mess. And if we can just all acknowledge that and be like, okay, let's just, <laughs> we're all fooling ourselves. Why don't we just get together and try and get this done? So I'm going to stop talking before I put you guys to sleep.
But thank you guys so much.